it's one o'clock on Tuesday, March 29th. So you must be watching Science at Soast. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness Mark. And every week we introduce a graduate student or postdoc, a young scientist, describing their research and how it's relevant to the state of Hawaii or general education. So today we have Gwen Bauer, who is a graduate student in the Earth Sciences Department. And our topic today is going to be Saturn's Moon Titan. And I'm really excited about that because back about 20 years ago, I was interested in an early mission to Saturn, and uh, that was called Cassini. And I'm hoping that Gwen can give us some updates on some of the research that she's been doing. So Gwen, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here on Science at SOST. And uh, this is an exciting topic. And I understand you're a third year graduate student. So this must be um, a really good educational experience for you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, talk about Titan. Uh, and I, I guess we should uh, explain to some of the viewers where Titan is in the solar system, because in previous episodes of this series, we've been looking at the Earth and maybe once or twice at the moon. Uh, but I, I believe Titan is a moon of Saturn. Uh, and I think our first slide will give us sort of an introduction. Um, Saturn is one of the few objects we can see uh, from Earth with our telescopes. But obviously, this is a much better spacecraft view. Um, how did you get interested in studying either uh, the Saturnian system or these outer worlds in general? Well, so I um, have always just kind of been interested in icy satellites. So that's what we call the icy moons of the gas giants. Um, I did a project in undergrad um, where I was um, modeling like impact dynamics and uh, one of my focuses was um, just kind of figuring out what would happen if a big object hit an icy body. Um, and so that kind of led me to Enceladus and um, maybe, I don't know if people know um, about Enceladus, but Enceladus is one of Saturn's moons also, as well as Titan. Um, and it has these uh, fractures in the South Pole that um, spew uh, vapors, um, mostly water. Um, and so I just thought that was really exciting that there's these bodies out there that are mostly made of water and ice. Why did you do your undergraduate work? Or why did you come to Manoa? Well, I came to Manoa um, because I found Sarah who was working on this um, project studying the dynamics of Titan's ice shell. Um, and I thought that would be perfect. This is Dr. Sarah Fajans, right? Yes, Seraph agents. Yes, okay, all right. And, and so you said you studied Enceladus, which is a, a, an icy moon of Saturn. I, I think to put more in context, let's take a look at the second slide so that we've got some understanding of how big some of these satellites might be. And we're focused today on Titan. And, and here's a great comparison between um, the Earth, Titan, and the Moon, right? Um, obviously, they're further apart than this slide would make out, but Titan looks as if it's a, a world in its own right. Would that be a, a reasonable assumption? Yeah, I mean, Titan's huge. It's, it's I think it's bigger than Mercury even. Um, and it's got just so much more water than you see on the Earth. Really? So so if you um, were to measure the, the volume of water in the Earth's oceans, Titan has more water. Is that because there's less rock in the interior or, or why do you make that statement? Um, well, I don't know if it necessarily is because there's less rock in the interior, but um, at the beginning of the solar system, when all the planets formed, if you were a certain distance from the sun, um, you as in imagine you're a little baby planet or baby satellite, um, you could accumulate more volatile materials, um, water being one of the main ones, because you're further from the sun, so you're not going to vaporize. Um, you can accumulate as ice. Okay. Uh, and um, Titan 
being out as far as Saturn is from the sun, it, it must be much colder there. Um, it looks as if it's got uh, a variety of surface features. Maybe our third slide will show us um, some of the early views on Titan uh, with an artist's sketch in the background. But um, how have we discovered different aspects of uh, the geology and atmospheric chemistry of Titan? Here, here are four different images. Can you just walk us through what we're seeing here? So um, the first few images, you'll notice that it's just kind of a yellow blob. Um, and it's tricky to look at Titan because it's it's got such a thick atmosphere. Um, the surface pressure is one and a half times that of Earth's. Um, and Earth has a super dense atmosphere as it is. So these images kind of just show the atmosphere blocking our view of any of the geology going on on the surface here. Um, the, I guess, last image here, we can see some more features because um, we're looking at it in a different uh, wavelength. So the first three are going to be visual um, images. And then this last one is uh, in the near infrared. Um, so we can see more of what's going on down on the surface. And, and it's interesting that, um, you know, the first, the top left image uh, was dated 1979. And it just looked like a fuzzy orange ball uh, in those images. And it really hasn't improved until, you know, like 2004, um, when you've got these different ways of the infrared data. Um, but Titan is a really interesting planetary object in its own right. I think the fourth slide will let us sh show the viewers a little more of how Titan is different from the Earth. Uh, and uh, here's the atmosphere. Uh, talk to us a bit about the atmosphere uh, of Titan and how it differs from that of the Earth. Well, I mean, it, the fact that it's mostly nitrogen doesn't make it that different from the Earth's atmosphere. Um, I think the Earth's atmosphere is roughly 80% nitrogen. I don't know, do you know, Pete? Something around there. Um, <laughs> 81. And it's got like, huh? Yes, 81. So close. Um, and then it also has a little bit of methane. Um, it also has like a lot of different like hydrocarbon materials that actually fall to the surface as uh, rain, which is another similarity with Earth. Um, but it's very cold. So this rain isn't going to be liquid water, right? It's it's liquid hydrocarbons, which is really exciting. And I know we have a slide in here on the lakes. And, and, and the atmospheric pressure is about one and a half times mm. that of the Earth. So, um, you yeah, know, we, we had a question come in on the chat show. Is it possible that humans could actually live on the surface of time? Um, what would be your feeling on that? Um, be chilly. A bit chilly, yeah. And of course, you couldn't breathe the atmosphere. Doesn't appear as if there's any oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. Hardly okay. any at all. Hardly any at all. So that that would be quite a challenge. And the temperature nearly minus 180 centigrade. I guess that's what minus 290, minus 300 Fahrenheit. It is really cold. Do you know what water would be like if it was on the surface of Titan? At that temperature, oh, it, it must be, it would be presumably ice, but much colder than even the ice in Antarctica. Mm. Right, right, right. Well, the last the image we saw that um, some images were collected back in 2004, and I think that was from the Cassini uh, mission. Um, the next slide should show that Titan actually has quite a variety of landscapes. And is this a computer generated image, the one we're looking at right now? Um, that there seems to be lakes and orange land. Is that for real or is that a computer generated version? Well, a little bit of both, I guess. It's um, this image is, is based off of um, radar images of the surface from Cassini. Um, from radar images, like we know that these like liquids 
Um, they appear um, smoother and they also appear radar dark. So, yeah. Um, so we can then interpret what these features are and they assign these colors to it. So this isn't a visual image. You're not actually seeing like blue liquid methane and ethane lakes, um, but those are lakes in those areas. And, and I'm told that, that the largest lake there, um, Krakomai, is actually bigger than the Great Lakes in, in North America. So these are fairly large uh, puddles of liquid. Yeah, these these are huge. Um, we we call the bigger ones seas for that reason. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. A a and but the radar lets us see the surface. Um, these earlier images that we saw, Titan just appeared to be a, a a fuzzy ball, but the radar has a long enough wavelength to see down to the surface. Yeah. So the the radar can can see through the atmosphere. Um, because it, it just it bounces off solid surfaces. And so we can get information from that, um, avoiding the whole atmosphere problem. And yet we have to assume that the atmosphere, just like Earth's atmosphere, must be changing the, the, the surface over geologic time. Because these are old surfaces, right? They're probably older than North American continent would be my guess. Mm. Have we seen any um, any closer levels of detail that this is um, that was a radar image of roughly the North Polar region of Titan. Um, what's it like in detail? I understand there was a, a European spacecraft which actually landed on Titan uh, in 2004, right? Yeah, so the, the Huygens probe, um, it took a lot of measurements of the um, atmosphere mostly because they weren't really sure if it was going to make it um, upon landing, but it um, landed in, I think it was one of the more equatorial regions, um, just based on these images here, it looks a lot drier. Um, and as it landed on the surface, you can see these like mountain ranges um, and actually on the surface, there's evidence of like rounded rocks. Um, and so rounded rocks are typically associated with like fluvial processes because they've been eroded um, or aeolian. Um, and so that just tells us that there is an active weather um, process happening on Titan or there was in the past. And let's take a, a closer look at, at those three images that um, the Huygens probe took, not on the ground, but during its descent through the atmosphere. Um, mm. it, it, it looks as if, you know, there's a shoreline in the, the top left image and that, that sort of um, dendritic pattern in the top right looks very much like streams or river valleys. Would, would that be an incorrect interpretation? Ooh, I think that's a correct interpretation. Um, in these regions, though, it, it is dry now, um, but these are most likely leftovers from when it was wetter around this area. Okay, does that mean that the climate has changed or that um, you've got some annual variation in uh, when it rains, for want of a better term? Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I don't know the time scales that it happens on, but um, like one interesting thing about Titan is, is most of the lakes and seas are present in the North Pole. And in the South Pole, there's evidence of previous lakes and seas, but they're all dried up. Um, so this tells us something is changing um, with time. Okay. And there didn't appear to be many big craters in that radar image. Um, craters, of course, is a, a proxy for telling how old the, the landscape is. If there are many big craters, it's presumably an old area. If there are few craters, then it's quite young. So this North Polar region of Titan is quite young, geologically speaking. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's it's very young, and and all of Titan too. There's not a lot of evidence of craters, um, and it's similar to Earth in that respect too. Um, it's got this like active weather that's eroding potential craters. 
So, so you really need to be a meteorologist as well as a geologist to, to study mm. time. And I think some of your, your actual research that you're conducting, um, that involves both the, um, the meteorology and uh, some of the, the interpretations of the landscapes. Maybe the next slide will show what the atmosphere on Titan is. And um, I believe this is just a schematic. Um, we're looking at things where um, particles falling out of the atmosphere. They're not that big, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so explain to us. Uh, so this is kind of, as I understand it, the research that you're doing. What are you trying to model here? So um, we're actually looking at these special types of lakes in the North Pole that are different than like the seas um, and these um, like more irregular shaped lakes. Um, part of the reason that um, Titan's kind of exciting is there's so much methane in the atmosphere. Um, and based on um, the fact that there's photochemical reactions happening in the atmosphere that's destroying methane. Um, in order for this methane to be sustained, like something needs to be replenishing it. Um, and so that one of the one of the ways this could happen is um, something called cryovolcanism, um, which is essentially volcanism, um, but with uh, like water um, and other volatiles involved. Um, and so we're looking at these special types of lakes and thinking, those kind of look like explosions. Um, okay. Is that a way for methane to get delivered back to the atmosphere, maybe? Oh, all right. And your next slide, slide eight, I think, shows some of these uh, uh, unusual looking features, right? And, and here again, I think at bottom left, we're seeing the North Polar region image again. Uh, and uh, what are a, B, C, and D. Um, how do you interpret this image? So, um, yeah, we're looking that little red box. That's where we're looking. It's just this one area of the North Pole. Um, A, B, C, and D are four examples of these weird lakes I'm talking about. Um, they are unusual in the sense that they have this circular crater um, and some of them even have if you if you look at uh, I guess a b and c all have it there's like this inset crater um, that implies maybe um, like collapse um, the radar bright as in the white circular area around these craters um, we think could potentially be um, like ramparts of ejecta we do um, think these ramparts are raised um, which is strange. You, you don't expect to see a lake that is elevated. Um, so D is one of the um, drier ones. So you can see A and B, those dark regions in the middle, um, that is interpreted to be like liquids, a wetter area, um, as well as the areas around the uh, radar bright uh, halo. First glance, could they not be meteorite impact craters, or um, do you see the same kind of landscapes which are non-circular? Well, so the reason, well, one of the main reasons we don't think they're impact craters is because of this inner um, ring that uh -huh. shows up in a lot of them. You, that's just not, you get more of a bowl shape um, when there's an impact. Um, and it's also unusual that they're in one of the youngest regions on Titan. Okay. All right. And, and are there any similarities, you know, Titan with its atmosphere and what appears to be a hydrologic cycle? Do you see something comparable to this on Earth? Um, you know, uh, what, what kinds of uh, analogs might exist? So um, one of the uh, proposed formation mechanisms for these features is um, like volcanic mar explosions um, or like vapor explosions when hot magma comes into contact with water underground. Um, it usually forms these craters with like raised ramparts of ejecta. Um, yes. And recently, though, we uh, these features um, that's shown on screen here now, um, they're called gas emission craters and they've been showing up um, 
on the seafloor and in the Siberia and uh, Yamal peninsulas, they are pretty much gas explosions that um, create these massive craters and these raised ramparts. Um, and so we've drawn a connection between these features and um, raised rim depressions or the pits, weird lakes I've been talking about on Titan, um, because of the connection with the morphology and the potential contribution of methane clathrates. Um, so Titan is thought to have a lot of these things called methane clathrates. They're essentially like a, a gas molecule trapped in an ice cage. Um, and so if the pressure or the temperature changes, it can release this gas. Um, and on Earth, we know that there's a bunch of methane clathrates under the permafrost. And as the Earth is warming um, or the pressure is changing, they can release gas too. And so that's one of the mechanisms that's thought to form these features on Earth is the accumulation of this methane that's been released from clathrates under the permafrost and exploding. Um, so we're there's kind of a couple connections there. <laughs> And you know, one could ask, why does anybody study something so far out in the solar system? But is there a connection here? If you're studying these pits on, on Titan, might that lead us to better understand uh, these explosion craters in Siberia, for example? Or um, are you seeing? Well, yeah, that so. Sorry, can you repeat that? Are, are you seeing any differences between uh, the, the pits on Titan and that the really good analog that you had from Siberia? Mm, yeah. Um, well, so the, the Siberia craters, they're, they're a lot smaller. Um, if you remember that image said it, there was about 20 meters diameter across. Um, most of these features we're looking at on Titan are, oh, somewhere between I want to say two and eight kilometers in diameter across, so much larger, um, as well as the distance. The uh, well, the bright halo is what we interpret as the ejecta. So, as well as how far that is from the crater is a lot more than the ones on Earth. Um, but we are trying to um, like model this gas explosion process for the craters on Earth, so that we have this like higher resolution data set to test this ga slow gas accumulation and explosion model on Titan. And any guesses on whether like the lower gravity on Titan or the thicker atmosphere or the colder temperatures might explain why the pits are bigger on Titan than on Earth? You know, that was, I guess, one of my like initial hypotheses, like uh, the lower gravity would maybe contribute to the fact that these features are bigger. Um, but we found that because of the super dense atmosphere, the lower gravity of Titan, which is about uh, the acceleration of gravity on Titan is like 1.3 meters per second squared versus Earth's 9.8. Um, the gravity and the atmosphere drag kind of balance each other out. So it's really interesting, like these objects that are the same size um, with the same initial conditions go almost the exact same distance for Titan and Earth. Okay, and you're trying to generate uh, gas to cause the explosions. Um, mm -hmm. Is the boiling point of methane uh, at the right sort of uh, temperature? Because if Titan's really cold, presumably you've got to get to the point where you go from solid to gas or something like mm -hmm. that. I mean, it must be a fascinating combination of topics where you're trading off gravity and atmospheric pressure and temperature and composition as well. Yeah, there's a lot of different things that go into it, um, but I think that's what kind of makes it exciting. But we're not really uh, modeling the vaporization of methane, just the um, release of methane from Clath rates. So the temperature needs and the pressure needs to be at the point where the ice can release the gas. Um, and so this can be done if we uh, raise the temperature a little bit, um, maybe with some thermal plume coming up um, from the lower ice shell, um, just heats up the surrounding ice and can release gas. Um, but these temperatures don't need to get nearly to um, anything much, much higher than the temperature of the ice shell already. And it, and it sounds like you, you know something must be injecting new material into the atmosphere, otherwise these hydrocarbons would no longer be present, right? So there must be some explosions or, or something going on. 
<laughs> well, yeah, um, so maybe yeah. this is one way. <laughs> yeah, time looks as really interesting. And I think the last slide will sort of give us a, a, a glimpse of the future. Um, obviously, as a graduate student, you, you're thinking about careers uh, later on. Um, I understand that the Dragonfly mission is going to be going back to Titan uh, in a few years' time. Yes, I'm very excited for this. Um, still got a little while, <laughs> but it should get there in 2034. Yeah, right. Um, well, you'll be a professor by that time, of course. But is this where you think your career might take you? That uh, you know, sort of research on outer planet satellites. Is that something that's exciting for you? Yeah, that that's the goal. Um, and I would love to be able to work on this mission too. Um, right. Sometime. <laughs> so, 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 who actually? Uh, not only individuals, but which countries are interested in uh, studying Titan? Is it just the, the US or the Europeans or do you know? You know, I'm not exactly sure. I do know that um, NASA and like John Hopkins, um, I think it's a APL Applied Physics Lab, yes. could be wrong, are the ones yes. that are um, running Dragonfly. But then ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, was a partner during the Cassini mission, mm -hmm. particularly with Huygens probe. So um, it, maybe there's a potential for that. But uh, yeah, it certainly seems that you know the further out in the solar system we go, there are all these fascinating differences between the uh, the way the Earth is formed compared to uh, Titan in this case, you mentioned Enceladus as well. So, uh, I, I, and when do you hope to complete your, your research? Um, I think I have a couple more years left um, okay. of this program. So hopefully before then. <laughs> well, good luck to you. When. Um, Thank you. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, let me just remind the viewers, you have been watching Science at Home at SOST. I've been your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest today has been Gwen Brower, who is a graduate student in the Earth Sciences Department. So, Gwen, thank you very much for telling us something about this really fascinating object out there in the, the distant part of the solar system. So thank you again for coming on the show. And for the viewers, uh, we hope to join you again same time next week. So join us then. And for now, goodbye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.